Tonya McGrath, executive producer and host of The Power Play Show. As we wind down our celebration of women for National Women's Month, The Power Play will be airing all week wonderful stories of women as we conclude our series, Empowering Women. Be sure to join us each night this week, that's Monday through Friday of this week, as I introduce you to more amazing women who are excelling in their fields and making a significant contribution to all of our lives. That's Empowering Women on The Power Play Show. From the studios at Hull Bay Productions, this is The Power Play. Welcome to our series finale of Empowering Women on The Power Play Show. I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. My guest today is an award-winning writer and producer who's worked for PBS, NBC, CBS, and the Smithsonian's Institute. She has won nine Emmy Awards, two Gold World Medals from the International Film and Television Festival of New York, a SEBA Award from the National Association of Black Journalists, and a Massachusetts Psychological Award for her contributions in broadcast media. With such award-winning productions like Journey of Courage, Ellington's Sentimental Mood, Surviving the Odds, Being Young, Black, and Male in America, and The Making of Africans in America, her work has always explored a deeper understanding of the Black experience in America. Storytelling is her first love. In 2014, she graduated from Grub Street's Novel Incubator, a year-long advanced degree program, and is now working on several novels, which range from exploring the history of her ancestors in Barbados to an intimate look at her mother's life. She once wrote, quote, stories hold the power to transform our lives and will remain an integral part of the humanity for as long as we gather around campfires, open books, and stare at movie screens. It's hard to put into words exactly what this woman has done to inspire me. As a young girl, I marveled in her presence as she stood firmly producing, directing, and being the head woman in charge. She took my sister and I on an adventure that has defined us to this day. She was strong when I was weak. She loved me through my pain. She looks up to me with such pride and affection and not realizing, and I tell her this all the time, you made me. I am so happy to introduce to you the reason for me being here right now, Cynthia Johnson, mom. Hi, sweetheart. Welcome to the Power Play. Thank you. <laughs> what an honor to be here. You know, I, I thought like way too long and hard about this to the point where I'm like, I'm just gonna talk to my mom. Absolutely. It's so just gonna be a conversation. Do. So no script, nothing. This, this is, is what, what we're we gonna do. do. You know, as a child, um, I remember you always giving my my sister Kia and I these wonderful creative projects and really giving us like, you know, I remember paints and, and crayons and drawings and and it was always like you just, you had this aura of creativity around you all the time. But your parents weren't very creative people. No, my mother sense. really was. She was? She was. She, I think, I think, I look at creativity as a way of seeing. Mm. And mom always had an, a, an aesthetic that I think we all have that we've gotten from her. But she would see color, she would see texture, she would, she knew from fine furniture, antiques, she, um, the, um, the black artists uh, that she had in the house, portraits, paintings, sculptures. Mm. So she had an aesthetic that I think, maybe she got from her mother, but I think we all picked it up from her. My father was really more someone who, he liked music, he liked yeah. books. So I think from the both of them, they was sort of like, I garnered something, maybe a, a, a hybrid of, of, from both of them. <clears throat> Oh, that's they're here. <laughs> they are here. <laughs> um, talk about as in high school when you really started to 
really figure out who Cynthia was. And you weren't, you didn't feel like you were like a lot of your peers. Talk about that a little bit, because I, I felt the same way at, in high school, that I was there, but I was almost forcing myself to belong to something. Yeah, I never really, I was never someone who really felt I fit in. Mm. And I look at it now, and it wasn't that I was mistreated by friends, or because I had, you know, dear friends to this day. But I think I just sort of saw the world in a different way. It was just always, it was just a different way, and I think, we come here with this, with these eyes and the sensibility and the sensitivity that we, thank God, God has empowered us with. And that's how we see the world. And I just always saw things differently. And I liked books, but I also liked theater, but I also liked nature. And the things that I were, was interested in, a lot of people, I, I don't think my friends were as interested as, uh, in as I was. So I think that's kind of, I had a dear friend, Deborah Eagle, or Eagle who I call mm. her. And we would just, we'd walk a lot. We would ride our bikes. We were always in Harvard Square. We hooked school together. I mean, she was my buddy. Yeah. And still is. So I think, and she understood me. She got me in a way. I'm not even sure. We, ever just, we talked about it, but she got me in a way that probably no one else did, or certainly the people that were around me, aside, aside from my sisters or my mom. But she got, Eagle got me and she allowed me to be in, 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 in relationship to our relationship. She gave me the space to be that. And that's how I felt very comfortable with her. A lot of our discussion today is gonna to be about voice finding your voice, what your voice is. I know I have my my journey too, but was it at that time when you started to really think about what your voice was? I don't think I knew from it. I don't hmm. think I even knew it as, as really a, as something that belonged to me. I just remember that after I left high school and I was out in the world working, one of my dear friends passed away, Kevin Adams. And um, it was around the time that I was really began thinking about what did I want to do with my life? What was I going to do with my life? I had two small children. And I decided to go to St. Thomas. And I went to St. Thomas because, partly because I didn't know what I sounded like. Mm. I knew what my mom sounded like, what my father sounded like, what my grandmother sounded like, and what I was expected to do. And all that was sort of there for me. But I didn't really have a sensibility or a sense of who I was. And I think what St. Thomas did for me was it gave me the space to find my own voice. And I, you know, I always wrote, I always had a journal, I always kept a journal. But I really, with, with, because there's so much uh, sky and sea and space, you know, there's really no place for you to go but inward. Mm. And I think being there helped me define my voice. And also, I had a dear friend, Hyphen, who was a cinematographer at, uh, at the PBS station there. And I remember I'd be writing these poems and thinking, oh my God, these are terrific. And I would read them to him. And he said, Cynthia, no, but that's not you. And I said, of course I want it. <laughs> and he said, no, that's not you. He said, until you can really look at yourself in the, in the mirror and read this, and it's as, as authentically true to you and what you perceive and what you know huh. about certain it's you're just making up stuff it really has to come from you out of you and I think he began to kind of help without pushing me but he got me to start thinking about voice in that way um, and at the time you know Maya Angelou was writing and there was another writer Marita Golden who had just published a book and Essence was you know doing these fabulous articles about stuff but it just sort of like, it was just fodder. It was mm. just stuff that I was sort of observing and 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 um, sort of observing and, and saturating myself with. But it was really Hyphen who said, you know, you really, he said, it's deeper than that. You've got to go deeper. I remember talking to you about this. We had moved back from St. Thomas because our house burnt down. And I, I really hated leaving St. Thomas. Mm. Um, and I went to boarding school and I didn't fit in with anything. 
I started my own language. Yeah, I, remember, I love that. I, I created I my own language. language. Right, right. And so when we talk about voice, it was my needing to do something that just belonged to me. And that's what it is. And made me um, interesting and different right. in a way. But I, yeah, I had the whole alphabet designed out. Right. And... Yeah, exactly. And, and people were like, well, what language is that? And, and I, re- I can't even remember what the name <laughs> that I made up for it. But I remember this one professor saying, like, that's not a language. And I was so hurt by that. And I, because for me, it's like, well, I created it. Of course, it's a language. I made it. It's yours. It's you know, yours. It's mine. Right. Um, and it was, it was just really defining to me that I... I knew how to make something my own. And and I think that was my first kind of experience with mm-hmm. that voice mm-hmm. when you talk about finding your voice. Um, and in high school, you know, it, as I mentioned, it, it was just a very, it was a hard time for me. Sure. Because, um, you know, my, my best friend Stacy, who's still my best friend, of course, and, you know, she was the one person that really got to know me, but I I was so desperate with wanting to be like other people. Right. And didn't understand why I wasn't like other people. I didn't think I had, I just knew that I wasn't. Mm. It was them, or it was other, and it was me. And I think that, unfortunately, our educational system and our professors and our teachers no one can give you voice but you. It really comes out of you, mm. and you have to discover that for yourself. And once you do, everything changes. Yeah. The way you see the world, the way you perceive yourself, um, the relationships you have with others. The re- relationship I had with my children changed because of my ability to sort of hear me and know what I sounded like. And to claim it in a way that, you know, I'm not a weirdo, I'm not you know, a bizarre human being. I just this is who I am. Yeah. And this is what this is why I'm here. And to understand that, it's just it just it just sort of swept away a multitude of sins, I think. I remember in high school and you were working for the then W N E V T V in Boston. And I would come <coughs> down me. to Government Center and I would meet you there. And um and just watching you in that space. I knew immediately that I wanted to be a, the boss one day. Like it was, it was just, I marveled in it because y- you were, you were kind of a badass. I know it's so terrible <laughs> to hear that. My sister tells me, reminds me of that all the time. It's just that I think, you know, I, I, I think going with, I think, well, well, in this whole theme of your Women's uh, Month, it's very hard for men to accept women mm. to have to have our voice to, for us to have our voice to have our accountability to be in supervised supervisory positions they're not accustomed to that and you can't go in there asking permission it's like i had a job to do and i had to do it in a certain amount of time and this is what i want and i think i wasn't disrespecting them but i was also making sure that they they understood that it was my way or no way mm. this is my production mm-hmm. i'm the producer here this is, my, you know, I'm answering to my executive producer and the head of the department. So this is what has to happen. Right. And I have, you know, this, you know, uh, this couple or this individual or this topic that I have to get done. And so I have to be, ca- I have to be mindful of what's in their best interest as well. So I don't have time to negotiate mm-hmm. if you like me or not, if, if this is the right thing. Mm-hmm. It has to get done. And I think that's kind of, and I, maybe that's from my mother, because I think she has that way as, <laughs> about her as well, and my grandmother's too. But um, I don't know. It just a television is a very is a very funny thing for me, because I went into TV thinking that it was going to be the most creative place mm. ever, and I could write and I could come up with some ideas and all of that. And it was it wasn't that for me. I kept feeling. Okay, I can do this, and when can I get out? Like, when am I going to be able to leave? Because, all right, this is good, all right, this is good, but can I go now? Is it time for me to go? And so with some, a lot of people would, would say, I uh, talking to a friend of mine, she was saying, I just always felt like a fraud. I didn't feel like I was a fraud, but I knew that this wasn't my tribe. Mm. This wasn't where I belonged. 
and yet I was thankful to do it. I had some good, I had fun. I met wonderful women, Donette Marjorie, uh, Eileen Silverstone, Angelica Brisk, um, Judy Stoya, um, Natasha. And Natasha, oh, who I adore. Yeah. Um, the late uh, Virginia Bartlett, mm -hmm. you know, Emily Lovering. I mean, there was just a wonderful Suzanne Simpson. I mean, yeah. lovely, lovely people. But it wasn't where I belonged. And I, one of my closest friends I met, um, uh, Robin and Letty. I met mm -hmm. them, these two of my best friends, I met them through television. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't me. And I just knew that it wasn't. And I just didn't know when I was going to be able to leave. And, and do what I needed to do. Is it because you didn't feel like you had a voice there or it was someone else's voice that you were trying to make into yours? Like what, what was the, well, I think the struggle then? In the last couple of years, it really was more about making sure that people had their own voice mm. and they told their stories in their own way. So that was, you know, that was really, that was, that was my concern. That was my, my objective. But I think for me, it wasn't, I wasn't telling the stories that were moving me. Mm. It, it just, it just didn't, it didn't feel like it's, that's where I want, that's where I wanted to be. And I remember the, the last probably year or two before I left GBH, I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning writing. Mm. And I couldn't wait to get home, you know, and the, it's like my characters are waiting for me at the top yeah. of the stairs. I couldn't wait to get home because I had to find out what happened. Yeah. And that was kind of the fire in the belly. I remember doing an interview with August Wilson and, and, and interviewing the late um, Elliot Norton. And how he described August Wilson was that he had a fire in his belly. And I was like, fire in the belly, okay, what is that? But I knew once I started writing that I had, that there was something within me that was feeling that this is what I had to do. And I, you know, I, I really, I really, um, compliment or I really owe the late Lloyd Richards, who I had submitted something to the um, uh, New Haven, um, the Yale School of Drama, their playwrights, whatever, and I had submitted something. And obviously was, I wasn't accepted, but he wrote me this lovely note that said, you know, keep writing, you have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, it's true. It's not the secret that I've been holding on to. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. And I think that's what I wanted to pursue. You know that old adage about, you know, you die, you go to heaven, whatever, and God says, okay, well, how did you, why didn't you become who you were supposed to be? Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't want to be that person. Right. And says, Anna, get back. You know, I gave you a chance, a couple of opportunities here. What did you do? No, get back. So, I, you know, regardless of what happens with my work, it fills me. It really is the reason I get up in the morning. It's, it's, it's glorious. It's glorious. I started my career in television mm -hmm. when you were there. And if you do remember me telling you that this is the worst place I wanted you to be. Yes, And you don't did. do this. You, you told me not to go into television. <laughs> right. You told me that. And, you know, for me, when I, because we collaborated, I worked sure. for you on a uh, number of productions. Saved me. No, you have saved me on a number <laughs> of productions. And, and, um, and for me... It was always, you know, that song, it must have been cold there in my shadow. Right. That's how I felt around you because oh. I had you up here, oh. but everyone else did as well. And I knew that I had a gift. I knew I was a great producer. Gotcha. I knew I was a good writer. Well, no one ever taught you anything. I, I, I still to this day, that's what I marvel over. I don't remember teaching you anything. Yeah. If anything, it was like, Tony, what is going on with this, with this? <laughs> This uh, this machine or this tape machine or how do I yeah you know how can I get this margin in this I was always looking to you I mean if you remember whenever we would move who would set up this, my stereo system <laughs> <laughs> I still don't understand how you did that. I don't know <laughs> you did that so but but you know it, it was interesting because even though I knew I had these gifts I wanted to define myself outside of your shadow and that's why and you I have, started you, you have doing the technical stuff which doesn't sound as creative but for me it is yeah, because good. I'm I'm creating something and I still have my voice in it but it was it was um it was a, it was great having you there I remember the, the one thing that bothered me is you said to me 
Um, I know what you're going to say. Oh, God. You said, you know what? Level of stone. No, you won't. You said, you know what? We're, we're professionals. We're colleagues now. I think you should call me Cynthia. I know. And I... I just didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> I think I went into the bathroom and I started crying. Oh my god! Because it was it was even like I, I can't, you know, I, I can't. You're my mom. You, but I think, I think what I, and I and I couldn't articulate it then. But I think what I wanted you to understand that you were equal. That this wasn't something. You, I wasn't your mommy. You weren't there so that so that you had to somehow subjugate yourself to me or defer to me in any mm -hmm. way. You were Tonya and you were there in a professional capacity. And so you're Tonya. So Tonya to Cynthia, that's what it is. But I know that I, I when it. I told you, I remember and I said, oh, I just didn't do that really well. Okay, <laughs> Strike up another thing that I'm going to have to live down. But I, and I tried, but I couldn't, I just couldn't. Well, you just, up, like, and you just stopped talking. You stopped I calling did. me anything. I did. I, I would just walk into your office like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> um, we, we both had, um, we, we crossed over a couple times at GBH because you left and then you came back and then you left again. And when you left that second time, um, I really knew that you were, on the verge of doing something How did for you, know? you. How did you know that? Because I didn't, there was I, a I was weight. hoping. There was a weight that you, that I saw on you. Every time you walked in there, there was a weight. And I knew a lot of it, and we won't get into the specifics, but it was other people trying to control you and control your voice and control your message through the work that you were doing for Basic Black. So when you left, I really did see this weight off of you. And it must have been a little frightening to leave. I just, but I don't know, I couldn't stay. Yeah. I think it was, I just knew that I couldn't stay. It just, it was just getting apparent, and I think for everybody, that it, that I, it was time for me to go. Um, but I also knew that, you know, I always told my, my kids, you and, and, and the kid, that, that you have to do you, you have to follow your dream. You really have to go after it. You have to take that risk. And so that's what I, I thought. And I, at that time, I had found a wonderful agent, Karen Johnson, who um, I had given her a draft of uh, the piece that I was working on, uh, Praise House. And she said, yeah, it's time. It, it, yeah. And it's, it's that. That's yeah, what this is. <laughs> except that it's not this anymore. It's not. But I remember when you gave this to me, and this was 1998. Wowza. Yeah. Wow. And you gave this to me to read, and I did read it. And I thought to myself, well, she's going to have to sign this for me one day when she's, <laughs> when she's winning all these awards. But how, how did your process change? How did your creative process change? Now not having to work for someone or being beholden to any kind of restrictions. How did the creative process change for you? I think at first it was like a purging. Mm -hmm. And I and I look at some of that stuff now and it's like, oof. Um, not that I'm ashamed of it, I'm not. But I think as a writer you go through a process and you know that because you're a writer. Um, and I think those first couple of years, it was, I knew I had something but it, and it was close. But I think my writing really didn't change until my mother died. Mm -hmm. yeah. After Nanny died, something shifted. It was it was just huge. It was just a huge, like something like something like a portal opened. And it wasn't that I was. I think I've always written because I'm, I'm trying to figure something out. I'm trying to understand what's going on. Why did this happen? What is it that I didn't know? And I'm so I'm sort of on a scavenger hunt so to speak but after nanny passed i think i stopped filtering and something just hey whatever's out it's coming out mm -hmm. whatever it didn't matter because I mean, for me it was like the worst thing had happened my mother died so what else could happen terrible except go after but you were kia but after that it was like I had nothing to lose. Mm. I had nothing to lose. And so I remember working with my agent at that time, and she said, what? What happened? I said, I don't know, but I just know I, I just feel like I wasn't, no, I was no longer afraid. 
whether I was good, bad, or indifferent, it didn't really matter whether I was liked or not, or what somebody said, oh, this is a good job, whatever. Or I was, it, it's, I found approval or appreciation. And I didn't care. I just had to write this from what I, mm. from how I felt. And it just felt free, it felt, it felt liberating for me. And I just, it was like my voice sort of went just to, it was another octave. It felt like I had just gone to another level. I had the um, incredible opportunity to interview Nanny. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that this morning. And, um, and I'm going to play a clip here where she talked about you in relation to um, just this brilliance that she saw in you. Your mother, extremely bright, could always write. And she never believed me when I would tell her how great she wrote. And she won a scholarship to uh, Carol, uh, Cynthia, to uh, Emmanuel. And she won one to Emerson. And I thought thinking that Emmanuel would, was the better school because she'd get better marks, you know, do better in later life. But I wish she had followed what she wanted to do and gone to Emerson. I regret that, but I guess things worked out the way they were supposed to. She was always larger than life in our, in all of our she lives. She still is. And she still, and she still is. But she was so proud of this clan of women <laughs> that she created. I must say, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't even say this earlier, because this really is the reason that I write, or why. I never had a, a, a black professor or a black teacher, so it was always white folks. Mm -hmm. But what I did have was my mom, and she took me to films from the time I was four years old. Yeah, she did. And we would walk home, and we would deconstruct the story. And I would say, well, Mom, why did so-and-so act this way? She said, well. And she, would, she was my coach. She was yeah. my teacher. She, told me, she taught me more about stories and plot and why people do the things that they do and why this story is necessary and how it, how it impacts or resonates in terms of the larger community, specifically the black community. And so she was always the person who I went to and I would read to her, but she always, she gave me that. She mm. gave me that love of story and she always helped me sort of define or determine certain aspects of my writing. And, and she was my first reader, so for, for very long, for yeah. the longest time, anything I wrote, I would pass on to her. Um, now I have an, another reader, Letty, um, but for the longest time, it was my mom. And I think, and she, you know, having gone through Grub Street and my, you know, life at process at GBH or through all of that, really the most important uh, I would say influence on my life has been Francis Sylvia Stedman. Talk about Grub Street because I remember when you were accepted into the novel incubator program, this advanced writing program, and um, I remember the, I guess you would call it the graduation ceremony mm -hmm. of you, mm -hmm. and we were all there. And oh, just to see you up there, and it was like, Yes, my mom's a writer, yes. And I always knew that you were, but it was just like you had accomplished something that most writers are not gonna be able to do in, in a particular program like this. Did it give you a little bit more confidence? Did it give, what did, what did that experience give you? Well, first of all, I was surprised, not surprised, but I was really happy that I was um, uh, accepted. And I didn't realize how significant it was until Chris Castellani, who was one of the um, uh, directors at Grub Street, uh, came in and he said, well, this is really an advanced writing class. And this is sort of like a master's program for fiction. And I just started to freak out. I just said, oh my God, what am I doing here? This is a mistake. This is the first writing class I had ever taken. Mm. And so I'm here with this, these other doctorates, you know, people who, I mean, one of my dear friend, Pat Solner, she, she has her PhD in literature. I mean, I mean, these are accomplished human beings. And, you know, I said, what am I doing here? But having said that, it was a very supportive group. Michelle Hoover, who, who was wonderful to me, 
But I think the most important thing that I got out of it was, it just strengthened my own voice. Mm. I said, no, I, I know what I know because I know it. And I, this is, and so it just gave me the strength to continue on my own path. It sort of confirmed what I knew about myself and certainly my process. And technical stuff, yeah, they gave me a lot of that. But in terms of me being who I, my voice, my sensibility, no. It was already there, forged in stone. <laughs> Talk about some of the stories that you are developing now and you know in your voice talk about what your style is how you approach an idea how you approach a story I think I'm, I tend to be visual so uh, recently I was working on something and all I saw was an old woman in one of those um, carriages or buggies that you would see in the late 18th century and she's walk and she's she's she knows she is meandering along this road and she's just sort of you know very very fixated on what she's seeing and so I usually come in with an idea or a visual that I, I can see it mm. or I can feel it and then I just write I just write it out and I don't try to figure out where I'm going because I think that's I, I now a lot of writers they have an outline and that's what they do right. For me, I have to allow myself to be led. Because hmm. I never feel like I'm there alone when I'm at the computer. I'm not by myself. There's somebody else. Trust me, I'm not that smart. There are other people, there are other entities around me who are either whispering or telling me. And I sometimes hear it. I'll sometimes hear the, the voices the, 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 or, or the words before I actually write them. Um, and then I usually, you know, if I'm not reading to Sydney, I'm reading to Letty or I'm reading to a friend of mine, Payat, and, and I'm getting feedback from them. And Payat will say something like, but what did it smell like? Mm. Mm. Or Sydney will say, yeah, but I don't know if, did, what was she wearing? And what they do, those notes, just sort of bring me back into the story, which I, I'll just hit a different level or just go deeper. It's so different how I approach things. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, um, cause I, because I think I have more of a technical sure. mind, I do have to do the outline. I have to know kind of where I'm going. Um, but for me, and you know, I, I, I used to write poetry all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to write um, poetry as well. Um, for me, taking on the task of writing a book seems to be like, Oh, nobody in their right mind would do it. I, I, I can't even I mean, you're think crazy. about And I have tons of ideas. <laughs> yeah. I have nobody tons right of mind. ideas. No. One of the stories that I, all, that I do want to write one um, day is The Little Black Girl in the Big Chair. And it's about directing and oh, being I in charge. Oh, I love that. And I love so that. I come up with the title and I know what I want to write. Right. And then I sit down and I'm like, I just don't even know how to begin right. this. But so for me, it's, you know, and, and I'm still, and I'm so, you know, I'm so busy. I'm running a production company. I have my podcast, which is my voice now, which is just incredible. Um, but I do want to get to that point where all these stories I have in my head, I can get out. And what advice can you give me to even start thinking about how to do that? I, I think I've learned, and I've been at this for about 20 years now, that stories choose you. They don't, we don't choose them. We think, okay, I've got this brilliant title and this is my character, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's crap. <laughs> I think they choose you and they choose the time. Mm. Um, you know, I couldn't do this. I couldn't be the writer I am without Sebi. Mm -hmm. He supports me wholeheartedly. It's this is, and he stays out of my way. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes try to drag him in, but it's like ridiculous. But And I will read to him sometimes. Mm -hmm. But he, it's like he trusts me to just be Cynthia and write and whatever. And it works. Trust me, it works. But I think, I think you will know. I mean, I, there'll be times when I would literally dream themes or dream sequences or scenes in my head. There have been times when I'm, issue, I'm, I'm wrestling with an issue and I will get the answer in a dream. There are times when I literally have to, to sleep with some, uh, a, a pad of paper and a pencil beside my bed because I'm getting the answers. 
But I think you will know. And I couldn't write this, these stories when I was 40 mm. or 50. Mm. I think it's just now that I'm coming to a point where I'm saying, ah, I get it. Because there had to be some distance, but there also had to be um, a perspective or a sense of a sense of myself or the sense of the world that I've come to understand that I didn't have then. But I don't think you, I, I think writing is so difficult that you don't choose it, it chooses you. Mm -hmm. And then you're just, you are in service to it. You just do it because there's nothing else, you know, there's nothing else you want to do. This is it. Do you ever have writing blocks? Times when it's no, just because not even working. when I'm not writing, or when I mean not writing, sitting in a computer, I'm still writing. Mm. I'm walking, and I'm you know I'm thinking about a scene, or I'm thinking about a character, or something is I'm working something out in my head, or I'm thinking about what I've written, and I may go back and, and as opposed and, and then go back and sort of after after that thinking or that that thought process, go back and maybe do some revisions around that. But I'm always work. It's always with me. It, it's it's like I'm not. It's never far from me. One of the things I'm have always been most proud of is just your your love and support of me and everything that I've done. And wasn't hard. Well, you know, and I, I talk. A, I mentioned this in my introduction. You know, you loving me through my pain because. Things weren't always easy. I made some bad decisions. We all do. I drank for 30 years. And, but you were always there. And you never, I mean, you give me the look of death. And anyone who's ever worked with my mother knows what the look of death is. Well, you have to have one. <laughs> but it was, but it was always in, you gave me the space to mess up. You gave me the space to be Tonya and whatever that meant. And you just you just stayed there. And that for me just it almost was just like, oh, well I can do anything. I really felt like I could do anything. And you can. And I think even when I was working with my producers, um, I always felt it was important for me to create an environment for them to do their best work. Mm. You know, I can say, yeah, I want to interview this person or that person, but I had to give them the space and the sensibility for them to be able to bring what they saw in this person or this particular subject to fore. And I think I did that by just stepping back. I'm there, but really this is your story and this is how you want to tell it and this is their story and how they want to tell it. What are you bringing to that? How are you supporting this? And um, I feel like really that's not much different from being a, a good mom. You have to make sure that you're there. You have to listen. You have to provide guidance. But you can't impose. Mm. You know, I mean, when they're younger, of course, you don't go near the, you know, the the, the fire hydrant or the hot oh, stove okay. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But after that, it's like you really have to trust them to be who they are meant to be. Um, you know, the way I raised you is very different from the way I raised Kia. Yeah. You guys taught me different things, which, you know, was like, wow, this is really different. They mm -hmm. are their own people at two and three. And I think you have to be able to, to respect that, give that person room, that entity room, and just don't harm. Help, support, but don't harm. Right. The Power Play show typically ends with asking... I guess three questions. Oh my. And I'm going to start with who was your biggest um, writing inspiration, living or dead? And my, why? My mother. My mm -hmm. mother. And then I, I have to give uh, Toni Morrison because I adore her. And when I started reading her, it was like, oh, she writes the way I dream. Mm. It was like, oh, oh my goodness. She writes the way I dream. Yeah. So I understood her immediately because that's, it felt like my dream life. If you weren't in writing or producing in all the fabulous things that you've done in your life, was there ever another career that you ever oh, thought yeah. of? What? In my next life, I'm going to be an, uh, an archaeologist. That is so you. I, I just have that to, is I have to do so it. That is so you. Really, I have to do it. I, I just love that. And story. you're already doing it with, with the stones and yeah. everything in yeah. your backyard. I love that idea. 
yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, um, finish this sentence. I am an empowering woman because... Oh, wow, that's the hardest question you've asked me. Hmm. I am an empowering woman because... I trust myself. I know what I sound like. And I know who I am. And I'm okay with all of that. And I think that empowers me. I really do. You wanted to share something with us today. I'm just going to read you just a couple of paragraphs from uh, my story. It's the first part of a trilogy. And it's called Sweet Bitter Cane. So may I? Yes, of course. Okay. Chapter 1. Brian Farmlands, Christchurch, Barbados, 1905. An iron gate separates 400 acres of Barbados' most fertile land from the Caribbean Sea. Looking across Brian Farmlands, the gentle trade winds caressed his skin, and the heaviness Bertrand Standeven had carried for so long dissipated. Many times he stood at the edge of the Caribbean Sea, dwarfed by the enormity of his, of his expanse, wondering if he'd be swallowed up by the glistening liquid jewel. But this was the first time the ground beneath his feet had humbled him. The earth was his true master, and as the son of a stand even, Bertrand felt surprised his heart could still soften, surveying land rising with hills that sheltered its vista as if what lie ahead was a well-kept secret. Prior to a power he could no longer resist, something called him forward, toward fields of neatly planted rows of one crop or another. The plants aligned, clean and tight, like plaits of hair, and as neat as a manicured public garden. He could almost imagine people strolling leisurely amidst the flora. But Brian Farmlands was a working farm, once sustained by a full-bodied slave society, and a dozen chattel houses hovered around the outskirts of the property to give sanctuary to the 60 men, women, and children who now comprised the workforce of Brian's thriving plantation. A dirt road welcomed the newcomer into an oasis of colorful sights and sounds. At the heart of the farm, a stone windmill waved its arms in the air, powered by trade winds. Below an abandoned mill and several industrial buildings were houses, were houses for livestock, farm equipment, carriages, wagons, and drays. The dimensions of the landscape were deep enough to get lost in, and west of the property, the sugarcane billowed tall and wide as a hint of sweet molasses lingered hauntingly throughout the air like a forgotten promise. Vegetables, mangoes, guavas, and soursap flourished, but it was the cane, the sugar palm, that kept the, comp the, kept the farm thriving for over 200 years. Over the years, Bertrand will come to know the farmlands like the back of his hand, and the acreage will, come be and, and the acreage will become his home the place that sustains the better part of him. He'll walk it thousands of times, and lying in his bunk at night, his feet will itch feel, and feel as if they were retracing the rich soil. Brian Farmlands will hold his potential, what he hopes to become, and for the rest of his life, it will carry the deepest mystery for him, unearthed as he will be both by its time and beauty. I, I, I hear, I read your writing, I hear your stories, and I can smell the smells, I can see the colors, I can feel the texture of the people. It's, it truly is a, um, a gift. Thank you. And I'm just, you know, I'm no longer cold in your shadow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, That's the best. That's the best <laughs> gift you've given me. But um, you know, you are just one of the best things that have ever happened to me. No, I think you're the gift. You're, you're my gift. You're my gift, sweetheart. Mm. And I love you. Mm. I love you too. Thank you. Thank you.